Egypt, we concluded that the chemical attack was carried out by a Syrian Su-22 aircraft, which dropped three conventional bombs and sarin bomb in Khan Shaikhun. The sarin attack had killed over 80 individuals, most of them women and children, and injured hundreds of others. The UN has issued a damning report on the Syrian regime, with its investigators accusing Assad's forces of carrying out dozens of sarin gas attacks. Among the 33 incidents, the UN Commission of Inquiry on Syria cited the incident in Idlib province. That attack prompted the US to respond by firing missiles on Syrian aircraft. But the UN says chemical attacks continue. Well, joining me now from Yale University is Robert Ford. He was the last US ambassador to Syria before the war became full blown. He not only believes Bashar al-Assad will win the conflict, but also that US policy has played a part in getting us to this point, and we're at a very terrible place, aren't we, Ambassador Ford? Good to talk to you once again. So Assad has tortured his people, he's barrel-bombed his people. The UN now confirming that he's used chemical weapons on them at least 33 times. Despite all of that, you think he's, he's here to stay and nobody's gonna shift him off that throne right now. Tell me why. Well, I don't say it with any joy, I don't say it with any happiness, but the reality is that uh, Bashar al-Assad's government is advancing in the Damascus area, taking neighborhoods that it had fought for years to capture. Uh, his forces are advancing in eastern Syria and are now uh, in Deir Azor, the city of Deir Azor in eastern Syria. Uh, they retook Aleppo at the beginning of the year. They are advancing on all sides, little by little. It's gradual, but it is steady. It is continued. And there is no sign that any combination of countries in the region and in the world are prepared to change their policies and put real pressure on the Syrian government. And so Assad uh, militarily uh, will win the war and he will stay in power. And despite the crimes which you mentioned and which the United Nations has detailed, uh, he will not be held accountable. What's your biggest personal regret when it comes to your time as the most senior U.S. diplomat in Damascus at the time? I know you, you tried to raise awareness. You tried to talk to Barack Obama about what was going on. Do you have any personal regrets? I have uh, huge regrets on two levels. Number one, uh, the biggest regret I have is that so many Syrians who wanted simply to have accountable government, wanted to have a better government, I don't say democracy, I just say better government, um, they failed and so many of them uh, died. Many of them died terrible deaths. On a personal level, I regret that some of my actions uh, were interpreted by Syrian opposition as to mean that they should either take up arms or that they should have maximalist demands in negotiations. The United States always said that the opposition needs to negotiate a transition government with the Syrian government, with Bashar. Uh, but we haven't even been able to get to a serious negotiation yet. Barack Obama staying out of the conflict was that a mistake? Should he have intervened militarily? Well, first, I think we have to remember that this is a conflict between Syrians, first and foremost. It's not a conflict involving the United States at the first level. It's not even a conflict involving Russia and Iran at the first level. It's a conflict between Syrians. And Syrians, Syrians have to find a solution to these Syrian problems. I do think the United States could have done more in 2012 and 2013 and even 2014 uh, to help reach a serious negotiation. But that negotiation depended on the Syrian government feeling real pressure. And frankly, it never did. And so it was always easy for the Syrian government to refuse to negotiate. As we speak right now, the war still rages and, you know, as you say, Assad is 
maybe stronger than ever. He's got Russian help. He's got Iranian help. Some see the country now is just becoming a sort of Iranian vassal. Is that how you see it? Is, is Assad just essentially Iran's boy in, in their new phase of uh, empire building in the region? No, that is not how I see it. As I said, this is a primarily a conflict between Syrians, and it is a conflict primarily about Syria. Unquestionably, for sure, Iran has a big influence now in the Syri with the Syrian government in Damascus, no question. And Russia also has great influence in Damascus, no question. Uh, but the final decision about what the Syrian government is going to do are not made in Tehran. Uh, the final decisions are not made in Moscow. The final decisions are taken in Damascus. And in particular, given that sometimes there is competition between Russia and Iran for influence in Damascus, uh, the Syrian president uh, is able to use one Iran or Russia against the other Iran mm -hmm. or Russia. Uh, he's a very clever uh, political figure, and so uh, he is not just uh, a vassal, or he is not just a pawn of outside powers. Uh, I suppose in the past it was a question of uh, taking out Assad not being a priority maybe for President Barack Obama. Under President Donald Trump, is probably not, not on the table at all, and the priority is to defeat Daesh wherever they are. And as a part of doing that, the current U.S. policy is by arming and funding the PYD slash YPG. Their sister organization, the PKK, blows up civilians here in Turkey. At the moment, the argument is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You've got to use these guys to defeat those other bad, bad guys. Is that a good short-term strategy? Or will it maybe backfire long-term? Well, first on the... On the Obama administration, where I worked uh, for three years on Syria, it was never the American policy to remove Assad. Uh, the American policy was to have Syrians, Syrians, negotiate a transition government where Assad would or would not play a part. Um, viewers might be interested to know that the Syrian opposition in Geneva in February of 2014 put a proposal on the table where they would have negotiated uh, whether or not Bashar al-Assad stayed. Uh, that was the Syrian opposition that did that. We were supportive. It wasn't really our business. So fast forward, fast forward to today, the American priority, as you said, is to, to eliminate, to destroy the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, uh, both in Iraq and in Syria. And the Americans, beginning with the Barack Obama administration in 2015, uh, began to work closely with the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia and even begin talks with its PYD political arm. I personally think that's a terrible mistake for two reasons. Number one, uh, it will aggravate ethnic tensions inside Syria. Uh, just as we have seen Arab Kurdish tensions in Iraq, uh, so I fear we are going to see more uh, Arab Kurdish ethnic disputes, conflicts, unease in northeastern Syria. The population distribution in northeastern Syria is mixed. It's not homogenous. There is a Kurdish town next to an Arab town, next to a Kurdish village, next to an Arab village or a, a Syrian village. Uh, it's very mixed. And so uh, trying to create a single political entity as the PYD is trying to do, yeah. um, promises to be fraught, to be full of difficulty. Second problem with the American strategy is that it is causing problems for our NATO ally, Turkey. Turkey is a big country, has a population of over 80 million people, um, and there absolutely are links between the YPG and the PKK, which is on the American terrorism list, it's on the Turkish terrorism list, and it's on the European Union terrorism list. And I fear that uh, in addition to the political damage that this American action with the YPG is taking, it's actually going to aggravate the security problems that our uh, Turkish allies confront inside Turkey. Mm -hmm. And as we sort of come full circle back 
to the beginning and that news that came in from the United Nations about the fact that they have hard evidence that the Syrian regime had gassed its own people, Assad had gassed his own people 33 times. I may be young, but I'm old enough to remember when Saddam Hussein was taken out for gassing his own people. So with, mm -hmm. that, with all of that in mind, right, all these countries, I know you say this is a war between Syrians, but it's, it's become a free-for-all with regional and international actors. Are all the countries that said it's okay for the Assad regime to stick around, and those who think right now, well, he's a bad guy, but he's probably the least bad guy, or he's not as bad as Daesh, or he's not as bad as Nusra, are all of them complicit or culpable in some way for wanting to keep him in power because he's gassing his own people? The problem with your line of argument is that the Syrians themselves have to decide what kind of government would follow uh, the Bashar al-Assad uh, regime, uh, the family, the Assad family that governs the country and the, the political allies that they have inside Syria. Uh, foreign countries, even if they were to remove Bashar al-Assad, just as the Americans removed Saddam Hussein, it doesn't end the fighting, it doesn't end the killing. There has to be, in the end, an agreement between a majority of Syrians about what kind of government and who in government uh, they will accept. And that kind of negotiation we have never been able to get to. Okay, Ambassador Robert Ford, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much for joining us.